So when I was young, my mom and dad had one of those old woody station wagons. You know, the kind with the, the fake uh, wood trim on the side that seemed to always be peeling off. But inside that car was a true innovation. My dad had installed an eight track tape player underneath the dash. And you have to realize, at that time, there were no cassette players, there were no CDs, the eight track was the thing to have in your car. The 8-track was invented in the late 50s, but it wasn't until around 1963 that a businessman named Bill Lear decided that he wanted to make a push for the 8-track. And see, when I was a kid, my parents, they had an old woody station wagon. You know, the kind with the, the fake wood on the side that seems to always be peeling off. And inside that, underneath the dash, was an innovation, an eight-track tape player. Now, if you don't know what an eight-track tape player is, it's, it's sort of like a cassette, but it's, it's bigger. It's like about the size of a ham sandwich. And in the 50s, people were trying to figure out how they could take music with them. And you know, you can't take a, a record player in the car with you. And a reel-to-reel -reel tape player was also kind of problematic. I mean, can you imagine sitting here with your reel-to-reel -reel tape player and as you're driving along, you're, you're reaching back to try to reflip the tape? So somebody wanted to figure out a way to put the reel-to-reel the -reel tape player in a portable version. And in the late 50s, they came up with the idea of the 8-track. And what it did is it basically took the two reels on either side and it combined them into a single reel. And that made it really easy. You didn't need to rewind. You could just put it in and it would continuously play. It's called an 8-track because there was eight tracks on it, just like a record. It didn't become popular, though, until 1963, when a businessman named Bill Lear decided that he really wanted to push for the technology. And he and his team at Lear Jets invented an eight-track tape that could be installed in their airplanes. Soon to follow was Rolls-Royce and Bentley. On the world's most luxurious and prestigious transportations, if you wanted to listen to music, it was on an eight-track tape. By 1967, Ford had introduced an 8-track on all of their vehicles, and it was great. By 1970, the 8-track tape player was the number one consumer electronics market in the world. I mean, imagine it. It's 1965, and you're an 8-track tape manufacturer. Things are going great. Products are flying off the shelf. The technology is getting better each year. It's going everywhere. You are in your heyday. What would you be doing with all that profit, all that revenue that you're getting? You'd probably be building better 8-track tapes, right? Maybe spending it on marketing or sales to get a larger portion of the market. How many of you would be investing in making the 8-track obsolete? Well, at the same time that the 8-track was taking off, the microcassette, or the cassette as we know, you know, the probably seen pictures of them if you haven't seen one in reality, um, was coming about. And it actually was invented about the same time as the 8-track. But the problem was, because of its small size, the 8-track actually moved at a slower pace. And that slow-moving tape caused poor sound quality. And so while you could get a cassette tape when the 8-tracks were taken off, nobody wanted it. It just wasn't as good music until 1968, a company called Dolby introduced Dolby B. It was the first noise reduction technology for the commercial market, for the cassettes. And with Dolby B, it made the sound quality on those old crappy cassettes better than the 8-track tape players. By the middle 70s, the cassette was taking off. By 1980, you can only find an 8-track tape player <laughs> in my parents' car or at a junk sale. By 1990, the cassette was selling half a billion units per year. But in the 80s, people started to realize that the cassette itself wasn't perfect. It was still analog. You get some hisses and some pops. And for any of you that have had a tape player, you know the tape would get stuck in the machine. What people wanted was a perfect reproduction of sound. And they also wanted it in a robust package. Well, Philips and Sony got together and realized that what, what people really wanted was a digital reproduction of sound, something that would be pure and would also be very robust. And they introduced the first 
digital recording of music, the compact disc. And in the 90s, the compact disc became the thing to have. The music was ideally ideal, right? And by 2000, two and a half billion CDs were being sold per year. How many cassettes? One million. From half a billion in 1990 to one million in 2000. In a little over a decade, the cassette, who killed the 8-track, had taken over. I think you all know what happens next. We got tired of carrying around 10, 20 CDs, and somebody realized that if we could take all that digital sound and put it into a little tiny box, a little hard drive, that'd be great, right? The MP3 player. And now, well, quite frankly, I just, I just listen to Pandora on my, my iPhone. Every decade for the past 50 years, the dominant technology in sound recording has become obsolete. Why is that? Was it that people didn't understand where there was value? Remember in the mac and macaroni and cheese, Kraft macaroni and cheese? The salesman saw the value, knew that people wanted a good wholesome dinner. That was the key insight. Here, no, everybody knows what the insight is. I want better quality music in a more compact form. So why didn't the eight-track tape player manufacturers work on the cassettes? Why didn't the cassette manufacturers make the DVDs or CDs? Why didn't the CDs make the MP3s? Remember back when I asked you if you were the CEO of an eight-track tape manufacturer, what would you be doing with your revenue? Would you be investing it in obsoleting your own product? No, that's not what we do. We focus on making what we do better and expanding our market share. I believe every company needs to have two COOs, a chief operating officer and a chief obsolescence officer. Somebody whose job it is to go throughout the company, look at the products, the services that you sell, and figure out what is going to make those obsolete. Or more to the point, how do you make those obsolete? Because you think about it, you want to be the one that has the next wave of technology. And the only way you do that is by looking at what is going to replace your current technology. Obsoleting your own products doesn't make intuitive sense initially, but when you think about it, it's the only way for survival. Think back at your companies right now. Who back at your company is focused on obsoleting your products? If you can't think of anybody, you might just be making 8-track tapes. <laughs>